Okay, so my name is Emma, and I'm a city sustainability fellow working at the city of Portland. Um, and we have put together um, three webinar series, and this is the first one, and we'll be starting with Maine Audubon, talking about um, bird-friendly habitats and how you can bring them to your backyard and um, attract native birds to the local ecosystem. Um, so this is Andrew Tufts, and he'll be presenting today, and then um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have room for questions if anyone has any. So I'll hand it over to Andrew. Thanks, Emma. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Tufts. I'm the Bringing Nature Home Program Manager at Maine Audubon, and i uh, going to talk to you today about how to bring birds into our landscapes. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Coming through okay, Emma? Great. Okay, well, thank you again for having me here today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm coming from Maine Audubon. And so the program that I manage, Bring Nature Home, is all about restoring Maine's natural biodiversity and habitat. Uh, and, do, and we do that through the propagation and promotion of native plants. So we're creating habitat for birds and other wildlife around the state, specifically by focusing on the importance of native plants in our landscapes. Um, today, we're focusing on one component of, of our program and that how to support wildlife or specifically birds, um, because what's what's better than seeing wild native birds in your in your landscape. Um, but in a place like Portland, where uh, there is more development, say, than much of the rest of the state, uh, there are a few things that we can specifically do to try to increase the amount of biodiversity and specifically birds in our landscapes. And the primary thing is making sure that we have the food that the birds need to eat. And so uh, what do these baby birds eat? It's primarily insects. I think the majority of baby birds' diets are, are on caterpillars, actually, um, small, soft caterpillars that are often widely available whenever there are lots of native plants in a place. So I'd like to start by talking about the importance of native plants and how you can introduce them into your landscape. So at Maine Audubon, we propagate native plants and we distribute them around the state every year. Um, and it's important to, to ask, what, what is a native plant? How do you define a native plant? And to that, oftentimes maybe there's some confusion around uh, the term hardiness. So this is often used in the agricultural world or growing plants for food. If the plant is hardy enough to survive the average uh, low temperature every year, then it can grow in your area. For defining native plants, however, the best definition that I go with is this one right here. And that if it has occurred naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without human introduction, um, it is a native plant. Whereas exotic plants that have evolved in other parts of the world were cultivated by humans into forms that don't exist naturally, uh, they, they don't support wildlife as well as native plants do. And so this, this definition comes from the National Wildlife Federation, which is a wonderful resource uh, for anyone looking to learn more. Another great resource for uh, defining and determining nativity of certain plants in Maine would be the Native Plant Trust, and specifically their website, Go Botany. And here you can see, as uh, shown on the screen, you can look up any plant that grows in New England, uh, for example, butterfly milkweed, and see whether it is native down to the county. So in Maine, butterfly milkweed is te technically, I believe, extirpated. So it was uh, the habitat that it once existed in is no longer no longer here. However, we have been, humans have slowly been bringing it back into this state. So while it typically was only found in some of the southern coastal counties, typically in pine barrens, um, it is coming back and it's a wonderful plant for uh, specifically attracting things like monarch butterflies. Uh, taking the definition of native plants a step further um, would be ecotypes. And so when you have a certain species of native plant, say for example, uh, 
a New England aster. There are multiple types, ecotypes of New England, New England asters that exist based on different environments that that species is, is growing in. So, and why that matters is because uh, plants that are growing in different environments develop different specific genetic traits. And this results in genetic diversity. And so if you are trying to create a species of plant that is as resilient as possible, uh, sticking to local ecotypes is the way to go. Um, and just in general, finding a plant, if you're trying to source a plant, uh, if you find one that is grown in your area as close to your habitat type as possible, you're going to have the best chance, chance of success. Um, in Portland, uh, when you are trying to increase biodiversity as much as possible and create and bring in plants that will attract the most insects possible to feed those birds, it's great to focus on keystone species. And that would be species that really support an outsized number of insects and wildlife, um, such as the red oak. Um, the red oak is uh, probably the number one keystone species in Maine. It supports over 500 types of caterpillars as, host, as a host plant. And it is just a phenomenal, phenomenal resource that feeds all kinds of wildlife. Um, in a city like Portland, it may not do as well as a street tree per se, but if you have the space for it, it's a wonderful shade tree and certainly one to prioritize. Um, and so if you're trying to attract the birds and feed as many babies as possible, uh, this is a good one to go with. Other keystone species, so keystone species include trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants. Uh, this is a great list from the National Wildlife Federation as well that kind of breaks down types of keystone species existing in, in Maine. And the great thing about this uh, website is it specifically will tell you, uh, based on the ecoregion you're in, what native keystone species exist and, they, and their associated uh, host species. Um, another distinction to make when looking at native plants is oftentimes if you go to a nursery, you might see, uh, again, say, for example, in uh, New England aster, um, but it will be, it will have been altered for, in, to bring out some certain trait, whether it's bloom color, size, uh, overall height of the plant, and that is what we call a cultivar. Um, so it's gen genetically altered to have a specific trait that we, that horticulturists uh, find desirable. And so at Maine Audubon, we really just focus on straight species or wild types. So types that are found uh, exactly as they are in nature and not altered by humans. And there are a number of reasons why we prioritize and, and focus on these wild types. And primarily being that the insects that have evolved over thousands of years with these plants have evolved in very specific ways to use these plants and to, to feed on these plants. So once they're altered, uh, you run the risk of taking away and interrupting that relationship. So it's really these wild native type plants that we are, need to focus on if we want to maximize wildlife habitat. And as I said, that's, that's really the, the problem with cultivars or exotics in the landscape is that um, for one, if it's a cultivar that's native, you may uh, run the risk of engineering or altering it away from its usability for wildlife. Um, and in addition, so exotic species, species that are not native at all to this landscape, uh, oftentimes they, the insects have not evolved with these over the years, so they have no use for them. They cannot eat the foliage. Uh, and while pollinators often can gather nectar from the flowers, it pretty much stops there. Much wildlife uh, cannot benefit from, from non-natives. I also like to mention when talking about native plants that just because it's native doesn't mean that it always plays nice with other plants in the garden. And that, that means that whenever you are introducing plants into a landscape, you are always playing with the idea of competition. And so some, some plants in certain environments will always be uh, better suited than, than others or potentially more aggressive and outcompete others. And that's why we really like to think about 
when introducing plants into a landscape, thinking about the natural plant communities that they come from. And so, so when thinking about natural plant communities, we're thinking about uh, habitat types and habitat types that plants are found in. A wonderful place and resource to start when thinking about habitat types is the Northeast Habitat Map from the Nature Conservancy. And what this talks about is really a concept called ecoregions. So it thinks about habitat types at the macro scale. And this is a wonderful resource where anyone can go and look at this online. And it shows a color-coded map of the entire Northeast region. And here I've shown the city of Portland uh, zoomed in. And you can see that the majority of the peninsula is color-coded what is looks to be pink. Um, and that represents developed areas, whereas all the other colors primarily represent specific eco-regions that have traditionally been found in this area. Um, so what that says is if you have a, an area like Portland that has been developed for a long time, the traditional habitat types are no longer there. But if you're trying to bring wildlife into your place and you're trying to think what, what should be here, this is a great place to go because you see this uh, tan color on the outlier, that would be the eco region that you might want to replicate in Portland. That said, um, when an area is heavily developed or developed to an extent that is beyond recognition of the original habitat, sometimes you cannot truly replicate the habitat as it was before. So you have what is called a novel uh, plant community. So you have an opportunity to one, bring in some of those plants that, are, that would have naturally been found there, but then also mix a variety of others to create what is a, a totally unique habitat type and provides a very uh, legitimate function at the same time. Another great resource to think about plant communities and natural communities and ecosystems would be the main natural areas program. And so this is a state organization where you can find all of these wonderful natural community fact sheets uh, of different habitat types around the state um, to get a sense of what grows well with what. Another great resource if you're trying to identify what's growing around where you live is iNaturalist. And this is a wonderful app that you can access on your phone and it shows um, both, it shows plants, insects, animals, um, based on what other citizens in your area have seen. You can see oftentimes if your neighbor logs what they see in their own yard, that can be a good indicator of what grows well near you. And so when trying to think about designing a landscape, especially in a developed environment where you don't have all these natural systems in place anymore, it's helpful to break plant communities down into what I call landscape archetypes. And those archetypes range from, uh, it, it really is patterned after, or modeled after the pattern of succession, um, which means in Maine, the state of Maine, if naturally left untouched, it would be roughly 99% forested. We are in an Eastern deciduous forest area and if, on its own, that's what most of the state would be. Um, however, if there's some kind of disruption or dis disturbance in the landscape, think fire, storm, and trees get blown down, that starts a process of succession where it opens up more sunlight into to a landscape. And that's where you would find things such as meadows or grasslands. And that's what we call kind of the first stage of succession, a grassland or meadow type. And many of the gardens that we create in our landscapes are often these kinds of grassland perennial beds um, that we think of for attracting, say, pollinators. Um, then it would naturally evolve to shrublands, um, which are an edgeland between a grassland and a forest. And finally, the forest canopy realm. And so just to break those down, I have a few examples of plants that you would find in grasslands or also just ground covers in your landscape. And the reason these are so important for a variety of reasons, but these often are plants that are have lots of flowers, heavily big pollinator resources, and provide habitat for our birds as well. Um, a great, great herbaceous perennial is, as I mentioned before, a tuberosa or a butterfly weed. 
And this is a type of milkweed that, of course, is a host plant for monarch butterflies. And if you're trying to attract monarchs to your landscape, but don't want to go with the, the more aggressive common milkweed, this is a great choice for more low nutrient sandy soils. Uh, New England aster is another super popular common uh, native aster to Maine. It's, I often like to speak of it in association with milkweed because it's a really important nectar source for monarchs once they emerge from their chrysalis uh, after using the milkweed as a host plant. And it's really important that we have these kinds of uh, synergistic plantings in the landscape when you have a host plant to attract an insect initially, but then a plant that will be in bloom later on to make sure that it has a sustained food source. Um, moving more into ground covers. Uh, so Pennsylvania sedge, this is a wonderful native carex that is uh, often used for creating a no-mow lawn. If you're thinking about getting rid of lawn, but you really like the aesthetic of lawns, uh, native sedges can be a great, great idea for replacement. That photo on here shows a uh, church in Lewiston that we've worked on. And there was once lawn here, and they decided to put in a large bed of Carex pensylvanica, which has re really worked well as this uh, lovely, lovely replacement. Another great uh, ground cover to think about is lowbush blueberry. And this is one that attracts uh, insects, birds, and people for its fruit and flowers and its foliage. So really a um, super impactful plant. It's a keystone species. As you see, it attracts over 290 caterpillars for host plants. And it's just a, a wonderful choice in, in most landscapes. And then I always like to speak about wild strawberries. So when talking about ground covers in the landscape, one great way to increase biodiversity in developed areas is traditionally we see gardens installed with tons and tons of mulch as the ground plane to keep weeds from coming up and to be more of a low maintenance type landscape. Um, naturally, this is just not something you would find. And the ecological method would be to plant with a ground cover in mind, a really thick ground cover that creates uh, what I call a green mulch. So for example, if you're creating a new garden bed and you have a bunch of taller perennials and shrubs, but you don't have anything on the ground plane, weeds will come in if you don't have mulch. So if you plant something like strawberry at a fairly dense rate, this will prevent those weeds from coming in. And it will also provide this kind of natural green mulch effect. Um, so shrublands and the forest edge. I always like to talk about this archetype as a place that you'll often find some of the most diverse uh, and prolific uh, bird sightings uh, in the landscape because birds tend, to, especially songbirds, really like these kind of edgeland environments and it's where you have a mixing of habitat types. And so in the developed landscape, when we think of shrubs, that's often where I see a lot of non-native or cultivar species. Think uh, rhododendrons or um, burning bush is an invasive one that often comes to mind. But there, there are so many fantastic native shrubs in Maine that you can utilize to replace these non-natives that support both caterpillars and birds for a variety of, of ways. And so these areas are where you'll find often nesting birds. You'll find the birds taking refuge here. And you also find them feeding on the berries or the insects that are feeding on the plant. A few examples that I'll just run through quickly that I really uh, like to encourage in this area. One is beech plum. So Prunus maritima. This is a keystone species, supports over 400 caterpillar types. And it's just a wonderful plant. It's often found on in coastal sandy dune areas. And so it, it's, it typically does well in sandier, low nutrient soils, though I've found it to do quite well in richer soils as well, as long as it's uh, fairly well drained. And so you can see there are these small little plums that develop that are both edible to humans and birds. Birds go wild for them. So it's a wonderful plant with also beautiful uh, flowers in early to mid-May. 
Another of my favorites, this picture uh, shows the service berry, service berry or Emelanchia canadensis at Hills and Farm at Audubon and Falmouth. And this is one of the early uh, blooming shrubs or small trees in the landscape. It has beautiful white flowers that come out in early May and great for early pollinators. And the berries later on support tons of birds. So if you're trying to attract uh, birds through the insects early in the season and then you, berries later on, this is a fantastic uh, small deciduous shrub or tree. And then one more shrub I like to always mention is uh, Lindera benzoin or northern spice bush. And this is a really fantastic edgeland species that grows really well, uh, specifically on these edges where it takes, it could take either dappled sunlight or full sunlight and it grows in kind of a thicket formation. And it has very small yellow flowers early in the spring and then these small berries later on. One uh, particular thing of note is the uh, a species that it is a host for is the swallowtail butterfly, so which is one of the most striking butterflies we find in our landscape. And if you'd like to support that butterfly, this is a great way to do that. And then just forest and canopies. So in in uh, urban environment like Portland, uh, think we often think about uh, street trees or um, areas like Deering Oaks, where we have these larger canopies at play. Large trees are much more difficult to get to survive in more developed areas because they need much more soil. Um, and so when it comes to keystones, I'd mentioned uh, like red oaks and whatnot are really important, but there are a variety of, of trees in Portland that could work really well. I will say when it comes to street trees, while I will always advocate for native plants, it is an area that, uh, it is much harder to find trees that will do well, uh, say, in a sidewalk, because that is such a uh, unnatural and uh, particular habitat type where you have this tiny little area of soil uh, in between all of this concrete that you will very, very rarely find trees that grow in that kind of environment. So sometimes it is actually uh, justified to think about using uh, trees that may not be quite native to this landscape in those kinds of super artificial uh, concrete heavy environments with little soil. Um, I like to mention this bird right here, it's black pole warbler, and just how important it is that we have the native plants here in this particular part of Maine, because every year as shown on this map, black pole warbler migrates from South America up to the boreal forest, where it is often feeding and nesting in the spruce forests. Um, when it migrates back south, it takes a much more particular route. And as you can see on that yellow line heading heading south here, it passes directly over Portland in this narrow window before heading out on this long migration over the Atlantic Ocean. And so the reason that matters is in mid-fall when this migration is happening, if we don't have the habitat that supports it and the insects and the native plants that support that that bird then it will not have the food source to, to provide it the energy to make that migration so it's super important that we think about making sure we have the food sources specifically in southern maine the most developed part of the state to make these birds uh, migrations possible and so just uh touching back upon what i mentioned earlier uh red oak Probably the number one keystone species in Maine as far as number of caterpillars hosted. Uh, Deering Oaks is a wonderful place to see some really wonderful specimens of this tree. And, um, and another great opportunity also to see this tree uh, in an area where the understory is being uh, reestablished. There's an area next to King Middle School where Maine Audubon has been working with a variety of other partners in King Middle School to reestablish this understory around the oak trees, because as you'll see much of Deering Oaks is uh, the understory is completely mowed. And so there's an area that has near the farmer's market where the city has been uh, not mowing any longer and other areas where we've actually been in increasing biodiversity by adding a variety of ground covers and shrubs to this landscape, which really increases the health of the trees and the entire uh, wildlife community of that area. 
Um, and then just to touch upon a few more resources when thinking about uh, how to bring in more natives into your landscape. I mentioned National Wildlife Federation. Uh, this is a great re resource where you can type in your zip code and it will come up with a list of native plants uh, ranked by uh, number of host plants, uh, host species that they support. Xerces Society is another fantastic option. It's, uh, this is an organization that's all about the insects. And if you're thinking about pollinators and trying to increase more pollinators into your landscape, uh, this is a wonderful resource that really focuses on that angle of what plants to bring in. I touched upon Native Plant Trust before, but again, this is just a fantastic resource. Uh, traditionally, I would go around uh, with a variety of uh, plant identification books in my, in my bag, but these days I often will just carry uh, my phone with me and use this as a resource for identifying plants because it's just so, such a fantastic resource. Uh, additionally, it's super fortunate to have a uh, wild seed project that exists in our area of Maine. This is a fantastic organization that I feel lucky to partner with. Um, and they support growing native plants from seed um, as, and are just a fantastic educational resource. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at their website. And then finally, um, our own website at Maine Audubon, the native plant, Maine Native Plant Finder. Um, so this website, uh, mainnativeplants.org, is a place where you can go to look up a variety of plants, all of which, all of which on the website we grow and sell every year. Um, and if you're looking to purchase these plants, we do have an upcoming festival and sale on June 17th, um, which is a week from this coming Saturday. And so this is a just a wonderful opportunity to come and see these plants in person and purchase them if you'd like. We also have a variety of really great speakers lined up um, and a variety of partners will be there uh, as educational resources as well. Um, if you're not able to make it in person, we do have an online sale that starts the week following the festival on the 23rd uh, with Thursday, Friday pickups throughout the entire season until the end of September. And with that, I encourage you all to get out there Plant some native plants, and uh, hopefully you can see some of these beautiful bluebirds this season. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I We can open it up for questions if anyone has some. Um, does anyone have any questions right off the bat? Yeah, Melissa. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. If you don't have a yard and you're in Portland, what keystone species will survive within like a container? That's a, I'm glad you asked that. It's a great question. So um, I meant to kind of say it, when you're in an urban environment and uh, space is limited, scale is something to really think about because of course the larger area you have, the greater biodiversity you're going to be able to support. However, the smaller area you have, the more important keystone species become because then you can increase the wildlife capacity that much more. Um, so uh, I would say when thinking about container gardening or they're gardening in really small spaces, look at those lists of keystones, especially for perennials, and go to the very top. Look at the ones that support the very most uh, and try to bring those in, such as goldenrods, asters, um, milkweeds. Those, those are great, great options. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, uh, try to find keystones that will span the season so uh, that you have something blooming as early as possible and something blooming as late as possible with everything in between. So the combination of uh, looking at the host plant, the species that support the greatest number of uh, caterpillars, and then also the longest bloom time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Karen, you can unmute. Karen is actually Doug. Oh, <laughs> I am Karen's husband. So, um, I doubt the question for you, Andrew, about attracting um, more carnivore birds like owls. Are there things that should be plant planted to attract, um, you know, the things that an owl would eat? Hmm, that's a great question, um, and one that's. Uh, you know, I, there are a couple other uh, folks in Maine Audubon who might be even more suited for that question, such as Doug Hitchcocks or uh, Andy Kapanos. 
but my take on that okay. is generally, uh, you know, that's the the forest canopy uh, type structures that you're looking for. They, you know, those birds like owls would definitely prefer uh, larger areas of canopy, such as uh, some of the parks around Portland. Um, that said, uh, I also was just talking about Emma before, a uh, little before this, about how in Portland, you know, we have peregrine falcons now nesting in a variety of the building types. And so that's, there are a variety of raptors uh, and carnivorous birds that have adapted to urban conditions and actually are thriving in these settings. So um, for those uh, birds in particular, there's not, not much you have to do aside from just keep an eye out because I, I see peregrine falcons all over the city these days. I see them in the West End and the East End uh, on top of City Hall on occasion. So um, yeah, keep your eye out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one question I had was with invasive caterpillars and what they, um, whether or not planting native plants will um, would obviously attract more caterpillars, but will they also have the chance to attract invasives that we don't want here um, and what birds can do about that? And um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And one, you know, I think probably a lot of folks would immediately think of a brown-tailed caterpillar um, because, of course, oak, which is the number one keystone species, is also the favorite uh, food of brown-tailed caterpillars. So um, it's a tricky, tricky situation. Um, and and I will say that the tough thing with brown-tailed, there, there aren't many birds that seem to eat it in uh in great numbers. I've heard of a variety of birds, such as some towhees uh, and, and jays potentially that, that do eat them uh, here and there, but uh, not the numbers that we would like. So um, I, would, I would say rather than not planting those plants, uh, just figure out, uh, you know, if you have a patio or uh, out back, uh, maybe you don't want uh, um, to surround it with plants that are supporting those brown tail. But at the same time, um, if you're planting a landscape that are you know, small trees and shrubs, ideally it would be at a height that you can look for those nests in the winter and clip them out. That's typically what I encourage in a, in a residential landscape is uh, try to manage a landscape in a way that you can uh, look for those nests and, and get to them before they uh, hatch every year. Great, thank you. Troy? Thanks, Andrew. It's a really, really interesting presentation. I, I have a question about, um, so I think, you know, certainly on my property, and I know a lot of other folks, um, the, the ground ivy or creeping charlie, it like spreads everywhere. Is, is that something that adds any value or should we be trying to transition out of that? It's super hard to get rid of, so. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. I think um, so. When it comes to invasive species, uh, it's another one that um, Maine.gov has uh, great resources for uh, identifying invasive species and how to manage them, how to deal with them. Uh, but for things like ground ivy, vinca, you know, that that appear to you know provide that ground cover and not let any other plants get up, the the issue is they they're not letting any natives get through. Either. So I would definitely always encourage if you have an area taken over by ivy or vinca or a variety of other these other low-growing invasives, um, try to try to get rid of them and and replace them with a native ground cover. Well, sounds like the little native strawberries would be a, maybe encourage those to push out the ground ivy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, depending on you know, another thing to think about always is is it, it what's the sun shade situation and if it's if it's super shady there are woodland ground covers that would do really well versus a uh, very sunny site that's where um you know there are other types including strawberries that could fill that space cool thank you awesome does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up no okay well, thank you so much, Andrew. That was great. And um, just to remind the rest of you that there will be two other webinars later this summer, um, one on July 5th, which is with uh, Maine Cooperative Extension, and they'll be talking about soil science and how to read your soil test. And then there'll be one in August with the Wild Seed Project, who Andrew mentioned earlier, talking about um, building biodiversity and fighting climate or creating climate resilience um, strategies in your backyard with 
the help of native plants. Um, so you can check out our website. Um, it's uh, South Port or Portland uh, land dot, oh, I'll add it in the chat here. Um, but you can find it if you search Portland land care, um, it'll be there and you can register for those um, whenever. And then we will also be posting on our um, Instagram and other social media sites. Um, you can join or you can sign up there as well. Um, not seeing, I'll also send, I'll send an email out to you guys about with a link to the, um, to the website where you can register, but yeah, keep an eye out and look for some birds, go look for some native birds. Well, thank you. Thank you both again for having me. And, uh, I definitely will be tuning in to those, those following lectures, the two wonderful organizations. So, um, yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. Cool. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.